and BBI Foundation, BIP Kolkata. Uh, he's been uh, awarded the grand prize at ATCRS and best video awards by OSWB and by KAO. Uh, he has uh, 15 publications in peer reviewed national and international journals. And his areas of interest are pediatric ophthalmology, squint, cataract, refractive surgery, and ocular trauma. So, welcome to you, Dr. Love. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. We also have with us uh, the president of ISCRES, Professor J.S. Titiyal, who is the chief and uh, uh, professor of ophthalmology at RP Center Ames. Dr. Rishi Mohan, the vice president of ISCRES, will be joining shortly, director of MMI Tech Institute, New Delhi. Uh, professor Namta Sharma, who is the chairperson of uh, the Scientific Committee, ISCRES, and professor of ophthalmology in the cornea, cataract, and refractive surgery services at RP Center Ames, and also the secretary of AIOS. And uh, Ajay Mukherjee, who is the treasurer of ISCRES and director and senior consultant at Mukherjee Eye Clinic, New Delhi. So, uh, before we actually start the proceedings, I'll request the president, ISCRES, Professor Jay Stitial, to say a few words. Yeah, thank you, Rajesh. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our uh, ISCRES Friday. It was a great time between because of what AIOS. Now, uh, we are going to start again. Every Friday is for ISCRES. We know that uh, our motto is to spread the you know, knowledge, not only in the field of uh, cornea, cataract, and refractive surgery. Include the other subjects where we are actually looking for an outcome which has to be precise. And today's topic, uh, which has been uh, selected uh, by Iskera's team, especially Rajesh Sinha, well, I think the importance is to really much more than our adult cataract to achieve good surgery and achieve the refractive outcome, which is so important for a pediatric patient. You all know the concept of uh, selection of uh, cases, selection of a uh, type of IOL, selection of a refractive uh, uh, analysis of these patients. Subsequently, doing a post-surgery good uh, workup and follow up for these patients to avoid the uh, anxiety of these patients. I think uh, pediatric cataract is a real challenge for us to achieve the accurate refractive outcome, which is so important for these group of patients. So I understand uh, people who are going to join us today with this uh, webinar, they're going to learn so many things. And we have uh, the best person, most suitable person to speak on this subject, uh, Professor Sudarshan Koker, who is a world renowned. Uh, surgeon, not in the field of uh, cornea refractive cataract, but pediatric cataract. He's done live surgeries across the world, live surgery in the country. People have learned so much. And I'm pretty sure people are definitely going to learn many, many points, critical points today with this uh, webinar. And I'll request both our uh, discussant uh, panelists, uh, both Sumita and Love, to initiate good discussions so people take away very, very important points, which is so important for our pediatric cases. The refractive outcome is not only immediately after surgery, it has to be lifelong, and that is, is the challenge for us. And I, I consider this is one of the best topics we have selected this year. All yours, you know, uh, Sudarshan Rajesh. Thank you, sir. Now I request uh, Professor Koker to uh, the slides, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajesh, for having me on board and uh, Professor Titial to, for putting the words uh, which are beyond my comprehension because he's one of the best guys. Well, I'm a good guy, but uh, the best. Okay, everybody has to see how, how good we are. Uh, can you see these slides now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And the slides are sharing now? Uh, and it's uh, yes. full screen, Perfect. right? Perfect. Absolutely. So I'll hide it now. So, uh, pediatric cataract, I think it's a long journey for me. When I joined uh, in 80, 84, Dr. Titial joined 85, I joined, and we used to see pediatric cataract being done. So it used to be two two step procedure. One step, you go inside with the capsulectomy forceps. There used to be a forceps called capsulectomy forceps. Go inside, puncture the entire capsule at two, three places, and just come out and patch the eye and send them back. After three, four days, maybe next week, you go with the 18 gauge cannula, go in and aspirate the cortex, and that was supposed to be the cataract done. The you know that was supposed to be the state of art that time. So we thought there's something is amiss, and when we started having uh, ECCI wells, uh, fake uh, things improved. All these things came with a small surgery incision, closed chamber surgeries. I think that was the time 
to switch over to something which does not destroy the cornea because in the other patients, the one I just told you the initial technique with only the less than uh, capsule ectomy used to get secondary glaucomas and the cornea used to go for toss. So I think only 10% patients used to have good clear cornea. I think that's why this uh, topic becomes relevant for uh, this forum now. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the pediatric cataract, its management, and I'll try to give you a holistic approach in whatever 45, 60 minutes you've given me. And wherever you people are getting tired are getting bored you can just stop me and I, I can wrap it up please give me a one minute warning before okay so this is where we, i belong to and this is one of the biggest residency program in the world so no way you can have around 360 residents at once given time in a center i mean this i mean hats off to this place and whatever chiefs have been coming in the past especially the new chief also the present chief we were blessed to have all the equipments for the pediatric side i have a, a ubm machine for the that side i have my, microscope the top of the line microscopes which gives me callisto view so i can actually make a grid of five millimeter and do the rexis uh, accurately i have my uh, elus with me so i can actually see the retina there and then on the table so certain things which we have improved over a period and i would like to share that with all the colleagues and the people who are actually doing this field of pediatric cataracts so they can imp improve if i got a mail from uh, uh, Farooq Ogre, who is the head of the EPOS, he says that after seeing your sites, I have switched over to UBM in most of my patients, which I think is a remarkable thing. Okay, so why I'm talking about this? Because the quantum of the disease is not small. When we started this clinic about 20, 25 years back, we used to get four to five patients in a month and not more than that. Maybe in some clinics, we never used to get one patient, not even half a patient. A traumatic one used to come back. Gradually, slowly, we started picking up the clinic. Now, each of my clinic, once a week, we get about a 15 to 18 new cases. Uh, okay, so 20 to 30% of them are traumatic ones. And we did a study in the patients which are coming to us to realize what kind of patients, what kind of, what is the cohort and what kind of patients we're getting. So I'll be discussing that. But to the background, so whenever you see the pediatric cataract prevalence, it's measured with 10,000 live births. So in the developed world, it's one to four. And in the developing countries like ours, it's five to 15. But this data of one to four in the developed world also is not true because there's certain parts, if you see in the UK also, if you see it was 2.49 in 10,000, that was in the first year. But if you follow this patient from 10 to 15 years, they realize that it has gone up by 3.46, meaning that a certain patient who are developmental cataract have joined it. And there's a migratory population. So by population which comes with, with who are genetically pre predisposed to having these cataracts will develop, develop where, whichever part of the world they go to. In the United States, the data which we could pick up was 2.03, 10,000 birth. And in the Cameroon study, which was, I think, one of the highest pickups, there were about the 10.9% of the patients coming to them were pediatric cataract, congenital cataract, which is a huge number. Australia says 2.2 per 10,000, but this is at one cohort. If you follow this patient for longer, so they can add on. This developmental cataract in Indian setup is basically a part of our study, which I'm going to be discussing now. So this paper we published in 2012. So what we did, we picked up patients for two years in this from our clinic. So there were 1,047 patients. Uh, majority being male, and this is what we saw. We had developmental cataracts in about 50%, that is 45.6% of these patients. And the, the second line is the traumatic cataract. And these are totally avoidable cataracts. They happened during the Diwali, the Shara time when the patients were playing crackers or playing with bow and arrow without supervision of the parents. In a place like United States and UK, they have all these fireworks, but they're all controlled. So patients, it's not the children who are getting exposed to them, but in our part of the world, you can get these crackers on the roadside and uh, of course um, they're damaging the eyes. So there were lots of them were unilateral, but major, uh, there were many people who were bilaterally blind also because of the traumatic cataract. Then the third group I want to highlight is the last one, which is called uh, about VO. So people have done the surgeries, especially the surgery, which I was talking about earlier, doing the anterior capsulotomy and aspirating the cortex. And that's the end of the story. Of course, the posterior capsule will proliferate and cause uh, VO formation. So VO formation we picked up in, in our setup was 6.7%, which was the patient done outside. And 3% were the patient, which were complication of the cataract surgery by surgery done outside. So if you put them together, it becomes a 10% of the one problems, which were actually more of uh, like iatrogenic because you couldn't handle the disease properly. That's where the VO formation happened. And second, your surgery was not to the standard and you were not trained enough to do and you didn't do a good closed chamber surgery with a good wash and taking all the precautions. That's where the complications happened and your lens was not placed properly. I'll show you certain examples later on. So this 
actually article paper which was published in 2018 opened up our eyes saying that okay no we have still a big way to go and there's a lots of problems which we we are facing here okay so with the same thing in mind the right to site 2020 people said that if you restore the sight of one child is equivalent to restoring a child of a uh, vision of 10 adults because one child who's blind is not adding to the gdp of the country plus he's taking one more assistance with him 24 7 so basically there's more loss and um, so it should be operated and taken care as soon as possible okay so how do you start the workup when the patient comes in the first thing is not the parent uh, patient the problem is the parents which was a problematic first question is why cataract in this age well you have to explain them there's so many causes which i'll be telling you also second the best thing is to tell them that the cataract which is congenital is basically coming from the parents so it's not the child who has a problem it's the parent who's the problem so i tell all my parents all my parents will have to get their dilated pupil examination with the fund with the glow if they don't allow i don't see these patients and i can call a shot because i'm sitting in a place but i realize that 100 oh, percent people because they want to have a second child or the third, third child so you have to tell them you have to see your eyes also i think simple things like a nance horan syndrome if you if you see the mother's eye you might pick up a sutural cataract or a dot sir in the posterior subcapsular area vision might be 6 9 6 12 6 18 and they're not bothered because they never picked it up so if the male child has a cataract and the mother has the, the, the high chances that this, this could be a nance horan syndrome over the last two years, we picked up four patients and we checked out the genetic evaluation and we found out that that was a Nance Horan syndrome and which was uh, quite, you know, we felt very happy about a simple testing. The parents eye with dilated pupil has given us this clue for this. So examination of the child is important. Of course, the child systemic examination is very important. Plus the parents eye evaluation, I think, which no, no, none of, most of the people don't talk about. I think that's very important for, for me. And the other things which I, I think I'll, I'll keep talking about all textbook talk about the Bruckner's reflex. That's very important, but that's the last thing in my mind. I'll tell you what all things we see. So if I start the first video, this was operated patient. Now you see, we don't use teller equity because teller equity, you have an enclosed chamber. You've got, the, you've got a blocks on the side so that the child can see. It's not meant for the very small children. They get actually, they don't, they don't cooperate very well when you're in a closed chamber. So the, the Cardiff charts work much better. So the moment he sees his hand goes up and he points out and tells us what to say. He's a happy child. He was operated at the age of six months and he's about two and a half years and he's still falling up. And every time he comes up, we check his vision and we realize that his vision is improving. So you have to make sure that the glasses are sent properly and once they see and you once you see that response that gives you a kick you know i mean you feel so good about it okay the simple test is if it's a unilateral cataract cover one eye he'll allow the other eye moment you cover he'll actually move his head away so that means that the eye with one eye which is a good vision the moment that is covered he's bothered if you're covering the other eye he doesn't give a damn and he's, he's okay with it now checking ocular moments i think that's the important thing the moment you get these kind of moments now if i try to define these moments they're going up and down they're rotating over the z-axis and they're going in and out so you just follow this patient and you see and he's a happy kid so if you notice he's opening his palpable aperture he's trying to get more light into the eye so this was a congenital almost at the cusp of the congenital uh, the date and then more of more or less a developmental but has to be an element less than three months because the visual uh, fixation is not formed properly and now you see and he will do a face off. That's a face off. If all you must have seen that movie face off with the uh, Travolta and they change the face. All right, I think you must have seen it. So this patient is trying to move his hand in the front. It's basically something like when you do a, a VER, you have two ways of doing it. You can do a flash or you can do a pattern reversal. So it's something like a pattern reversal. His face, his hand gives a shadow and the light comes in. So this reversal of the pattern is what they stimulates the retina to some extent and then see. The other thing which you can see in children is if the vision is poor, they tend to rub the eyes. If you know this, see this patient, his eyes sunk down because of the rubbing and that's called the ocular digital phenomena. So the retroorbital fat actually gets absorbed into the system and the eyes is sinking down into the eye. So in, in this case also, the visual equity was good after the surgery. Although most of the patients with the ocular digital phenomena don't fare very well because they rub the eye to rub their retina so, to stimulate it by, the, by the, the flashes which they can induce. Majority of the patient will not do well, but in this, this is an example I'm telling you, even if you feel the protosis is poor, both eyes involved, you must give it a try for the surgery in this patient. And that is what your typical Bruckner's reflex, you put a, uh, on dilatation, distant direct, one has a glow, the other one does not have. Okay. Go to the next one. Okay. 
But this is another sign we picked up. Now, what happens is most of the child, when, when we see the child lying down and sitting up, we are used to seeing the patients in adults also when they're vertical, they're sitting up on slit lamp. So what we devise is a technique, it's called the shoulder grip. So put the child on the shoulder of the mother and ask the mother to look the other side. So two advantages. One, the mother is looking other way, especially during the COVID period, that was a big help. And the child actually is they stop crying at the start because the entire part of the body and the mother's body they are in contact so i think somehow that physical contact with the mother makes them uh, feel happy and the mother's hand is on the at the back and the child is holding the mother so they're very comfortable you see the other picture also even my residents can see the things so well now with the distant direct i think distant direct is what what everybody has to learn if you want to see the child because they're not going to sit on the slit lamp and if you're not able to see with your uh, distant direct or with the torchlight, anything, please take them up for an anesthesia examination. Otherwise, you might be missing on finding. Now, this is a patient in which on the lying down, the lens was like that nucleus and on the standing up, it went down. So it was basically morganin cataract, which is, has been picked up in the children also. Okay. So what I'm trying to do in the last test was to find out what is the level of the opacity. Is it a lenticular opacity or it's in the front or at the back? If it's in the front, I might have to call my cornea colleagues to have a look at the cornea opacity or Peters. One of those uh, uh, things could be stumped I mean, that the cornea guys will discuss. And they could, it could be a posterior to the lens. So posterior to the lens also, I'll give you the examples. So single important test which everybody should know in these child children are, is a direct ophthalmoscope after dilating the pupil. And even after you've seen that one, always do ultrasound and ultrasound all both the scans, A and B scan. So A, B scan will give you any gross lesion which you have. A scan will give the excellent. And please, even if the other eye is normal, always do a A scan of the other eye also, so you can have the excellent measurement there in them. And this you're doing through the lids. So whatever is added happening in one eye will happen in the other eye also. And you're you're quite close to find out if they, you're picking up a microphthalmic eye or if it's a PHP eye. So it works a big way. UBM, the child is not going to cooperate in the OPD, so it has to be on the in the OT. So whenever you do a UA in these patients, if you have a UBM machine, please pull it into the OT or so you can have one with the 35 and 50 megahertz both. So you can actually evaluate the things. Well, I'll show you some examples of that. And if you use a unilateral cataract in which you have a doubt for a tumor at the back, please do not hesitate to do a CT scan, although I know the cost is factor. And all these PFB patients also, uh, because only the 70% you can pick up on the ultrasound, the stock. So if you want to actually pick it up, CT scan is the one which will give you 100%. And we did a thesis. I'll be talking about that uh, in some time. And MRI of also if the patient can afford for the same reason. Okay, now let's see. Now, this is a typical bilateral cataract period. You can't miss it out. It's good. So was here. We thought it's a cataract. But on the ultrasound, we realized it's a detachment of both the eyes. So it's a leukocoria, but it was referred to the retina guys eventually. So if the reflex is not white, it's grayish and it's uh, rarefied, like grayish white in between. So you've got to be careful. And more important is this video. If you notice the video, there's a leukocoria in one eye, then you see glow in the other eye and it sh keeps shifting. If you have this kind of shifting leukocoria, then usually it's not the lens. If it's a lens, it's a subluxated lens into the vitreous cavity, which is opaque. Otherwise, if the lens is at the right place, then this is not the lens. It's something in the retina which is happening. And that's me sitting at the back in one of those busy clinics. So in this one, you have to have a help of a retina guy to help you out there. Ocular association, I think you must have all read about. There are so many things you can have. And basically, if you have ocular association, the, most of the time, it's a unilateral cataract, which has the eye problem. If it's a bilateral cataract, it's a systemic problem, which are more seen in these patients. So these are anterior segment and posterior segment problems, which could be seen in a unilateral cataract more than the bilateral ones. So NLED, again, is a bilateral. Glaucoma could be bilateral. Microphthalmus, again, bilateral, unilateral bowl. IFC, both eyes could be seen. This PFP is the one which is usually seen in unilateral. But we have seen patients with bilateral as well. Okay. Uh, systemic, uh, okay, I'll, I'll cover it during my talk. So coming to the syndrome, I think the commonest syndrome which pick up is a Down syndrome, which is from 10 to 30% if you see all the studies. So recently we picked up uh, other syndromes like Alport with a, with, a, with a, if you have a lenticonus anterior posterior, you can have Nance syndrome syndrome. We recently we picked up more. There was a uh, syndrome which I think when I was in Australia discussing and they were discussing a lot. This is called hyperferritinemia cataract syndrome. So when we came back from there, I used to send the sample for all the patients. Then we realized that if you have a B-complex deficiency, your ferritin level will go up. So uh, then I started taking this with a pinch of salt. So I don't get it done uh, that often. So let's see a few examples. So Down syndrome, everybody knows the flat faces. You can't miss out the phenotype. Very typical. Now, this was a patient of Nance syndrome. So in the patient, if you have to pick up the, it's a male patient, 
is a space uh, widely spaced teeth there's an antiverted pinna like the pk if you remember the movie the ear coming out so antiverted pinna and a prognathism is seen in these patients and that's mother's eye she got a sutural cataract and her vision was 612 and she was not bothered she never knew whether she had anything and this one actually all the investigations turned out to be positive for nan syndrome syndrome okay which is a x linked and it comes from the male uh, female mother carrier to the child now this was the other patient which we picked up two of these patients it's called conardi hunerman syndrome which is one of the rare ones you have alopecia you have a digit problem you can have arm which is short and this was the cataract now this cataract actually is a zonular lamellar but it's not a typical zonular with a riders i, I think smitha and love can make, appreciate this one it got the posterior subcapsular area central part as well as these are not the typical riders typical riders you see are the round circumferential lamellas with spokes coming out here actually it's not a spoke in most of the places it's uh, it's like more a, like a, a cupriform cataract which is happening so now the clectosemia everybody has seen so if the child is born with a jaundice and failure to thrive and every time the mother feeds the child gets uh, more symptomatic i think always over diagnose it and send to the pediatrician you might be wrong and you it might bruise your ego a bit but if the child is glycosemic and the mother keeps feeding the child will not survive so it's better to have this on the high risk so any child with a jaundice and a cataract congenital with the oil eye drop cataract some which i'm showing up there always should be having high suspicion of glycosemia and referred okay okay so one more thing which we added uh, which was not in the text earlier we started measuring the head circumference of all the patients in our setups so we realized that all these microcephaly majority of them could be rubella but there are other uh, uh, problems also and if you have a microcephaly with a pda and cataract and the hearing deafness you the chances are you dealing with a rubella so uh, recently we published one review article on a cataract in retropathy so we started picking up this patient uh, not now about 15 20 years back we had certain patient with a interlenticular hemorrhage and the patients were referred unilateral so dr parijath has this patient he was my junior resident he came to me and we published that then we realized that uh, it was becoming very often every year we used to get one or two patients and then we realized that that these were the patient which were rop and uh, they were having more problems so this was the cataract is rop so rop cataract is not because of the immaturity is but basically more because immaturity can cause cataract but that majority of the patients were actually having cataract after the intervention so the laser caused it and the interval injections the intervention injections you have to be making sure that you are at least minimum 3 mm away otherwise if you enter we had lots of these patients coming with a acute white cataract after the intervention injection so we had to handle these ones so that's why uh, this one this is igo it's a free article anybody can download and see okay uh, octo digital phenomena i already uh, talked about it so i'm going to skip this one now coming to the investigation the trick is in a unilateral cataract please look into the eye to the extent that you might have to do a ct or mri in these eyes so the re, the cause in 99% will be inside the eye itself i'm ruling out the traumatic first i'm talking about the congenital ones in which is a unilateral cataract if it's a bilateral you have all these set of uh, investigation you can get the torch igg im titers you can get uh, blood sugars you can have glycosemia checked out you can have patient syphilis alport all these things uh, i think everybody knows about that you can't uh, leave aside the serum calcium and potassium these things are important to be checked if you have high copper level you can have wilsons so all these things are already known but i've just put them into one, one format so you can actually have all these ones and it's a it's not that you do the investigate for all these patient depending on the morphology of the patient depending on the curvature of the anterior lens if you can make out you can do uh, tailor make the investigation pick and do them okay so we started a thesis with a guy called sejin who is going to usa now we it was unilateral cataract so we picked up all the patient coming during that period when he was there we 76 patient we recruited to find out what is happening and we try to do most of the investigation these patients and all these patient with the traumatic cataract uveitic cataract which were always most of them unilateral the traumatic ones we we didn't exclude those ones so these are actually pure congenital unilateral cataracts which are coming to us we realized that when we doing the analysis that it will be better to group them into pfp is a non pfp because 27.6 almost 28% of these patients turned out to be pfp and pfp is not that that rare because it's not that uh, so unilateral cataract with a small i keep a pfp suspicion very high even if it's not picked up on the ultrasound the stock i'm talking about you might have to do a ct scan in these patients we couldn't do the ct for all the patient but whichever patient we missed out we did ct we realized that the 70% is the pick up rate for the ultrasound that's what was the outcome of this article and if you want to have 100% you have to have a ct if your cost is not a constraint okay genetic of course 
the family has one child cataract as they'll always ask you whether the second child will have or third will have or not uh, this is what we feel that they'll ask but majority of the patient comes to us with us 10 kids in the family seven having cataract nobody has told them anything the uneducated people so problem is that even if we know genetic analysis we know which are the genes we just can't do much it's just more or less more of a theoretical thing for me from at least from my angle we picked up two novel genes what i did was i sent the sample to the genetic guys and they did it but the counseling per se and using these uh, to change the proteins in the family so that they don't have cataracts i think it's going it's going to go a long way Okay, so let's see what are kind of morphologies we have. The commonest cataract pediatric is is like a pulverized cataract, but if you see a distant direct, so I'll show you a picture with without distant direct and distant direct. So you can see the glow. If this patient is not having a squint and not having a, 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 a nystagmus, an abnormal movement, then I'll give a glasses and refraction because the central part refraction will change. So give glasses and follow these patients. Okay. Now similarly here you see a blue dot kind of cataract, this bluish in color. On the retro, the glow is not as bad, so you can hold on. And if you have one of those things like abnormal movements or a squint, then you might, might operate this patient. Now, this is a blue dot cataract again with the pulverance, but there's a little fibrosis which is starting. So it's not that you have blue dot means a pure blue dot. You can have these fibrosis also. This tells me that the pathology was not only one hit. It could be two hits because two different kind of pathologies are seen here. Okay, now developmental cataract, which happens uh, maybe a uh, little later in the age and the congenital ones from the birth, the only differentiating feature is that one will have uh, no abnormal movements, but so that because it develops maybe six months and afterwards, and the other one has uh, since birth, so the, the ocular movements will be abnormal. So if you notice here, it's a zonule, it's a central zonule involved, nuclear, plus a lamella on the egg around it. Now, this is a typical zonular which is what which was missing in the patient when I showed you that uh, uh, Nance, uh, uh, Honorary Hunemann syndrome. Now, this is what is a typical rider. So if you notice the round lamella with the riders punching, going like a spokes outward, this is what is a rider. And rider, by the way, we hypothesize and we send it to the ocular hypothesis one paper in which we thought that this is basically a, like a reverse cuneiform cataract. I must, I'm sure all these people must have read this article. So we said that the pediatric cataract with the, with the rider is more or less like a reverse cuneiform cat, uh, cataract of the, of the adult because it's reverse, it depends uh, facing the other side. Now, this is a cataract in which you have anterior uh, polar, nuclear, a little bit of zonular element and little riders here and some other abnormal opacities. So, so many things we know, the most of the we know very few about this yet. There's so many things we still don't know. Now, see, this is a typical lamellar cataract which comes to you. Lamellar means a zonular and lamellar, same thing. One zone or one lamella is involved. So whenever there's an inflection, whatever is causing it, and afterwards taken care of. So the lamella, the layers which are laid later on are clear. You can see it, the distant direct here. The center part involved and the mid periphery involved. Rest is all clear. And here, it's a very faint and if you can see just a faint, it looks as if there's an aisle in the eye, there's a lens in the lens. So this side doesn't need any surgery. The first one, if it has abnormal movements, of course, you'll have to go ahead and do it. So whenever you're not doing the surgery, please do a refraction in this patient and put them on glasses. Even if in the first patient, the patient comes to me, if there's a delay in the surgery, I'll put the patient on glasses. Whatever light is focusing in the eye, the child is going to be benefited. And in the post op period, they'll have to wear the glasses. So they get sensitized. So I put the glasses on, even if the cataract is a little more, because at, at least that way, they buy a pair of frame and get the glasses. Lenses can always change later on. Okay, so this was one of the brothers of the patient, not the patient, and I dilated of the patient. So whatever siblings come to me, I dilate and see all of them. So with a non-dilated pupil, we would have missed this house. So it's like a, you know, like a fan-shaped uh, cataract. I never could find anything in the literature till now. So it's it's like an incomplete lamella. It's a zonular cataract, but incomplete. It's it's patchy. Why and how it happens, nobody knows. Now, this is a quite a typical post-traumatic, they say it's a stud uh, collar button cataract, but this patient did not have any uh, surgery history of, sur uh, of uh, injury, sorry. So, but it's a typical, if you can notice, it's a stud button which you use for the collar, uh, so calves of the, of the shirt. No, this is a quadrantic cataract. Only one one quadrant involved is something like a, a party which is uh, got over and only one piece of pizza left on both eyes. This right eye and the left eye. And these are all human patient eye. These are not uh, sketches from any way versus uh, this one where the party has started and only one bite has been taken in each of the pizzas and rest is all there. Why it happens, I, we couldn't figure out. We tried all genetic touch things in this one, all the primers are used, spend lots of money. We, we still don't have answer for this. So there are lots of things. Uh, 
uh, there's a term called idiopathic. I think I would like to change the term idiopathic. I prefer a term, it's called idiotopathic. We are still idiots. We still don't know what we're looking and where we're looking. So where we don't know when we'll hit it and who will hit the mark and find out and say, okay, this is the cause for the cataract. We're still waiting for that. So all my colleagues from the pediatric side who's using the cataract, I think it's a very good idea to, uh, to pool our resources and come back and check out and see what is happening. So I'm sure you must have seen these kind of funny ones. And uh, okay. So now see if this this is the lens inside the lens. You see it's a raised one. And on the, on the slit man, this is a little bigger. This is five years old. So I can see on the slit lamp. So this is lenticonus. Then you start looking for the alport and also a typical uh, lenticonus. You can see you can't miss it out. Okay. Now this was the oil droplet patient. This right eye patient was taken and treated and this has already recovered. You can see a very faint droplet left. The second patient was not treated. It came to be a little late and you have a central fibrosis. The nuclear part is involved. All the periphery is not that dense, but the center when the pupil goes small, this patient needed surgery. The first patient, the other eye, actually the lens reversed totally. So if you pick them up early, you can do the diet controls and you can actually reverse these galactosomic cataracts. So that's why please have a high suspicion, especially if there's a history of jaundice there. Uh, and Niku stay. Even if you're wrong, I think you're helping the child in a big way. So these are typical sutural cataract, uh, straight Y in the front and the reverse at the back. And I think you all must have seen all these ones. When you do a retro elimination, you see the glow is good. So you don't have to do much about these patients actually. Now these are the cataracts, which was the entire family. So these are uh, not sutural per se, because suture is not something like this. So this is the entire family. And one girl is an MBBS student in this one and one is an engineer. This is the entire uh, family uh, photograph of the uh, cataract. So I call them uh, caterpillar eyes or a barbed wire cataract and nobody had a term. So everybody accepted this term. So we didn't have to operate all the patients, especially this one. This one were not operated because center part was clear. We operated uh, four of these uh, eyes and they're doing pretty good actually. So because they were patchy, the ocular growth was good, but they got stuck around a 612, 618, and the amblopia was not very dense because the lens was not involving the entire central part. So there's some light which is still going. But since this MBBS girl wanted the surgery, and after surgery, she had a 6-9 vision, which with the glasses improved to 6-6, six, six, and she's happy. Okay. Now coming to the capsules. Capsule can have anterior and the posterior polar cataracts. We are all scared of the posterior polar cataracts in the, in the, in the adults. In the children, you can have anterior polar cataracts. This is anterior with a pyramidal, so it's, it's raised. So this is anterior, but if you see, there's a contraction. So... It's a plaque, but it's it's gone below the level of the capsule curvature, uh, and this again is one of the one with the with the raised uh, tip on the uh, surface. So it's it's a pyramidal cataract, and now this is a plaque, which is again it's raised. This one is flatter. So plaques on the anterior and posterior capsule they behave differently, and anterior capsule plaques have to be operated uh, more than uh, the posterior capsule of plaques. Okay, so this again one of the patient uh, mother dilated. We saw the lentic uh, lenticular coloboma. That's the coloboma of the lens. Patient's vision was not affected, so we just documented and we tried to relate it with the child zonular cataract. We could not. We, we could not match anything in the genes also, which were pertaining to this. So we spent some money on that, but we never got anything. So we are still idiotopathic only. Now, if you have a cataract like this, this is a five-year-old kid. That's why the slit lamp picture could be taken. So you see the rarification white with the gray, with the lines. So this is the other eye. There's a right eye, there's a left eye. So these kind of patient tells you that there's already a pre-existing defect. So cataract morphology can actually guide you towards what kind of investigation you actually want to do. So in these patients, this patient, if you do an ultrasound on the table, you'll actually find there's something spilling over at the back. That means just behind the posterior capsule. And that's the post op result in this patient. Okay. Now coming to the traumatic one which you talked about, though this is a clo open globe injury. You can see arrow going in and out, coming out. There's anterior capsule which is ruptured. This is manageable pretty okay. Now what about this one? Somebody has repaired it. It's gone through and through. Even if you do the best of the surgery, eat up the, of, of the pupil, make a pupil in this one, he'll need a keratoplasty, glaucoma control. Most of these patients, especially unilateral, will not be able to match up with the other eye at all. So most of the eyes are actually lost. Okay, but this was anterior pyramidal with aniridia, which was first time we published and it was published in JAMA. And this was in the surgery, we had to do this one because this was right in the center in the vessels around. and. A uh, patient had little gain of vision, but there was a foveal hypoplasia in this one, and uh, it was not uh, too great as successful. But yes, we could pick up this and publish it. Now, that's a kind of Mickey Mouse cataract. The mothers tell me the child sees a cat, uh, TV a lot. So I tell them if the child keeps seeing the TV, 
they might have a Mickey Mouse cat right in the eye. So just to scare them. Now, this one is an atypical coloboma. Normally, we know the coloboma uh, inferior temporal, but this one is superior. So I think I'll rush through. These are anedetic. Uh, Rajesh, just tell me when uh, time is up and if you guys are had enough, I, I can go faster. Okay. No, no, no. Please go ahead. Fine. So that's aniridia. Now, aniridia never comes alone. Aniridia will always have a problem of the uh, anterior cornea. So there will be a dry eye. That's one of the conditions in which there's a primary limbal cell deficiency. So that's I'm justifying this by putting in a iskres uh, uh, talk. So you see this limbus. The limbus is gone for a toss. The lens is subluxated. You can't put an implant in this one. If you put an aniridic lens, there could be a uh, pigment which will keep dispersing and cause glaucoma. And the problem in this patient, aniridia patients, are that most of them will have a hypoplasia of the macula, and the vision is not, not going to be great in these patients, even whatever you, after whatever you do. So this is a luxation. And the other thing is luxation. That's close to my heart because I picked up lots of luxation patients. Now, this is a clear lens. That's a lens which has gone a little inferior. So it could be, and here also, again, we feel we are idiot, idiopathic, idiotopathic because we don't know the cause. I mean, I mean uh, Marfuns is the one in which you have a cardiac issues and then you call it a marfan according to the hands criteria. So these are all marfanoids or wheel march asani. They say typically you have short stocky finger, they don't match. So what I'm trying to say is that even in all these patients, maybe only two to three person are the one which are typical marfan, a typical wheel march asani, a typical spherophakia. Still spherophakia is the one in which you pick up very commonly the features. Now this is a lens which is come anterior. Of course, you can see the small lens, micro spherophakia. So that's what the name is. And the trick to pick up these patients is the lens is usually clear. They're not cataractors because there's no zonules, there's no lamella which is growing inside. So the cataract never forms in these patients. So majority of the patient which we pick up, if you can see all 360 degree on a retro, these are spherophakia patients and that's familial. Now that's the patient which has been done for the ROP surgery. Now that's not a lens. That's the silicon oil come up. There's a fibrotic band at the back as a membrane, which is thick fibrotic. Now this one, you can see a little hyperlion here. So these were done VR surgery for ROP for stage four or five, and they want us to come for surgery. So majority of them we don't do because there's a RD at the back. These eyes are not going to get anything. But if there's a blindness in both the eyes, we still try to open up a media in one of the eyes and see what we can do. Majority of them, they actually don't work very well. It doesn't go very well. Okay, so the single test which you are supposed to do if you're sitting in the periphery, you can't do, uh, if you can't examine the child, examination is, is a must in this patient. So please, before the child is brought to the OT, please check your batteries of all these uh, systems and calibrate them because otherwise you'll be wasting the GA time. So this is a typical video of a EUA which we do. So right to the patient is with the anesthesia guys. And once they stabilize the child, they'll hand it over to us. So first you do, all the non-contact tests and then so I'm doing a, a, a keratometry and an AR if the media is clear and we'll find out the refractive error in the other eye if it's a unilateral and that's how we get this is what the system is following we print out and keep the print out and then we measure the white to white of the eye so we have to measure the exit length and the white to white horizontal and vertical in all the eyes which are going undergoing uh, uh, EUA even if they're looking normal I think it's always better to compare the other eye also so, so many times we realized that uh, uh, it was uh, borderline, say 99.5, in which we thought was big because the child's head was small, so I look big. So there could be a correlation between the hydrocephalus, uh, microcephaly, and the size of the eye, which apparently looks wrong. And this is a red cam we're doing for the uh, uh, other eye in this patient to see the fundus, which I, uh, if you have, you should do it. Otherwise, it's not that important, a test. Okay, the important test is an excellent measurement. An excellent measurement, you try to have a good machine and always calibrate them. And you see, when you touch the eye, it gives me 40 in one go and 40 again. So I've got 80 readings now, and you can pick up, you see the lines are all straight and all good. And this is pretty accurate. And what we started doing now, we started doing UBM in all our patients. Now, what is the UBM? It's basically ultrasound only. It's 35 megahertz and 50 megahertz. So we use 35 megahertz in this one because that way we can go limbus to limbus, sulcus to sulcus. I can see the entire lens and that's what it looks like. And every time you use a sterile fluid and that's what you look like. You know, that's a congenital cataract with the central part. So I'll just show you some more images of that now after this. Okay. So that's a typical zonular cataract and that's the UBM of the patient. And these pictures are all published in my book, which I published. You can all download. I think it's freely available. Uh, you can, I mean, you don't have to... Uh, 
take the snapshot of these ones. So that's one. And you see now this one again is a zonal cataract. You can see the right on the side. And there's a central nuclear part which is involved, which is not seen here. And these are the kids who are younger. These are three, four, five year old kids, which are not going to show you anything on, on, on as such. The distant data you can see, but you can actually peep behind the iris and behind the lens also. Now, again, you see. This was the patient we're talking about. Now, you see, it's not a typical zonular cataract. You see the zonule doesn't have a regular margin. It's uh, like a cuneiform at the periphery. And uh, this was uh, Kunerman Haradi syndrome also, the second patient I talked about. Now, this is not a rexis which is done. It's a nucleus which is moving. So when I open this patient, this nucleus is going to rotate. So it's a basically Morgagnon cataract. You can see the cortex at the back, liquefied cortex, and the nucleus is floating up. You see that here in the in the UBM. So UBM tell you, tells you that there's no opening at the back. If there's an opening, the volume of the lens would have lost. You see the increase in the volume of the lens here compared to this volume is normal. And you see the volume here from anterior to the posterior capsule, it's increased. So it's basically swollen up Sporgagnon cataract. So be careful when doing that excess anterior because if you will not overfill the chamber, this capsule is going to run off because of the pressure, inter positive interlenticular pressure. All right, now see here, the volume has gone a little bit out. It's uh, uh, not that thick a lens. And there's a plaque in the front and you can pick up the plaque here. So this is the patient in which you middle nude need something to cut. You need a scissor on the table and you might need a diathermy or a plasma blade if you have. Okay, this is a traumatic one. It's plugged with the iris here. You can, sh I'll show you this cursor here. And there's nothing coming in the front versus this one. You see, there's a lens which is coming up. If you're smart enough to pick up, that's fine. Otherwise, if it's like this, it's already open. Then you can actually ignore this area, do a rexis at the normal area. And later on, you, after putting implanting into it. So you can plan your surgery, uh, uh, maybe a five minutes before actually you get into the eye, you know what you're going to get and you can prepare your table accordingly. Oh, that's spherophagia. I think I'll run through this one. Uh, again, one of those localized lenticular colobomas. That's how it looks. Now this patient, we thought anterior plaque will do it. And we realized that the, the posterior, there was a little posterior conus. Now, if you notice this one, the curvature of the lens at the back has changed. So it's going backwards. And there's an opening, the nucleus almost trying to go back and sink downwards. Okay, so now coming to the surgical. So when you want to do the surgery, the surgery has to be meticulous. The follow-up has to be uh, done properly because if you don't do the follow-up in this patient, they're all going to be amblopia into amblopia. They might have glaucoma or a VO. So if you pick up the VO and glaucoma early, you have to be very aggressively treating that. And you need a very good anesthesia team at hand. And we are blessed to have uh, Dr. Renu, Dr. Shinde at RP Center. I like to take the name because these guys are really gems and they help us in uh, finishing of these cases. And uh, I think we owe it to them a big way. Okay. So as I said, the concept of surgery is to make the central part clear. That's the first concept. Second is you can put an implant to make the light focus. So in case you're not able to put the implant in this patient, for God's sake, please do not eat the entire capsule. I've seen lots of patients refer to us done outside. They've done a lensectomy. Could you do a lensectomy for past plan of anterior, wherever? Please leave this peripheral 5 to 6 millimeter, maybe 4.5 to 6 millimeter away. Leave it alone for us. We can always put a lens at a most physiological place and sulcus and we can get away with that. So your aim is to remove the scaffold of the posterior capsule so that you don't have a VO formation because that's where the cells are going to grow and you have a support for the lens for the future. Okay. So is it uh, as good as doing the adult eye, the pediatric cataract? I, I find it much easier because the uh, adult one could have all funny things, but the pediatric ones usually are under anesthesia. So there's no movement in the eye and you are more uh, uh, concerned and, and you have already in, seen this patient and you want to give them the best. So don't be in a hurry to finish with the pediatric cataract. Okay. So what is happening? The eye is still going to grow. Palpable fissures, fissures are smaller, so you have to all kind of speculums you should have. Haparioba is common in the children. Exit length will change from the births at 17 millimeters to 24, maybe at the age of two years. And the keratometry, which is very steep, say 52, will go down. The problem is the sclera is thinner at that. So after four or five years, the sclera might go, become as good as an adult, and you can do all those funny things on the sclera fixation. But before that, if you're operating, I, I tend to avoid less than six years anything to the sclera fixated iols or uh, glued iols for that. But visual acuity by the age of six months in a normal child will grow and become uh, as good as six by six. On, on a the, the certain test on a VR, they realize that it improves. So which one to operate? Of course, the ones which have a, a, a total, this is an undilated pupil. So see them undilated, dilated both. Uh, first one has to be operated, second one needs the surgery. Third one has to be operated, fourth one. And the third one is a small opacity. So if the patient doesn't have any abnormal movements or a squint, then you can wait in these cases. Do a refraction, please, for God's sake, give them the glasses. Even if it's a very low power, they'll get used to the glasses. So whenever the surgery is done, 
they will need the glasses later on also because for the younger kids multifocal is not a way to go so you, they'll have to wear the glasses eventually so why can't we do immediately we see them because there's high chances of glaucoma in these patients and the chances of apnea and high chances of glaucoma will not be picked up at the age of one month over a period when you follow this patient up there's a study by greg et al from australia they found out that if they follow this patient for say 10 years the it goes 10 times folds so the glaucoma is more we have done a follow-up at our, our center also in all these patients where that's uh, it's not that high in our setup because i think our surgically i think we are taking care of them properly and that most of the lenses we're putting are putting in the bag this could be a problem with the, with the rigid lenses or a lens in the sulcus but with lenses in the bag with the foldable lenses and if you do a vitrectomy properly so that there's more space chance of glaucoma are low in this patient and whenever there's a doubt on the table the chamber shallow please always do a pa in this patient which helps you in a big way in these patients okay so four to six weeks is, is a time when the fixation forms that's the time for surgery so Prior to 12 weeks, we should do all the patient. And unilateral, we try to do as soon as possible if the anesthesia guys allow us. Okay, so why we are hopping on this point is because the anterior chamber is unstable. The moment you make a chamber, the uh, incision, the chamber is going to collapse. Scarcity is on the lower side. The elasticity of the capsule is more. Okay, so 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 this is if you uh, relate a pediatric with a geriatric cataract, I think. Uh, it's a ease of surgery depends on which group you are i can manage both easily incision you always have to have a three incisions in pediatric because you go bimanual and you can go 360 degree using a bimanual or a vitrectomy cutter so that you have to polish up because you can't leave any cortical matter in the smaller kid in the adult even if you leave it they, it's going to get absorbed if it's in the perif is not going to bother whereas for the kids you have to have a proper polishing and everywhere 360 degree so that's why two side ports are must okay let's see what we do so I, i'll give you some tips for the surgeries for less than two years i think more than two years as people are treating them like adult but more than five years yes you can treat them like adult surgeries so you don't even need to, need to do much under correction but from say six months or three months to two three years what you need to do is what i'm going to tell you now so first thing is putting the head right so once you put in the spec or uh, drape on the eye you're not supposed to move the child if, if in the adult you can ask the patient look up down and you can move his head shake it because there's no lma in pediatric so i put a ring under the head the neck gets a little flexed so then we use the shoulder for support it's nothing but it's it's a rod and we've got a cotton rolled over it so when i put it you see the neck going up a little bit it supports the lma as well as it extend the neck to the same extent what had flexed earlier because of the ring and now if you know, see the upper picture here the eye is rooting, looking right into the microscope so when you operating the pediatric kids the assistant is not supposed to touch the patient only you're supposed to touch the forehead just use a fingers to do the surgery you're not supposed to shift the patient position even if the patient is on the side you have to ask the anesthesia guy before shifting because the lmi lma might come out and you might lose the patient on the table and you might have more complication you might have, you need all kind of speculum small medium and large you don't know which which uh, how much is the cul de sac in this patient so all these and the all sizes of the ring are required in these patients so that i showed you already so it has to be a three incision surgery so i make always the first incision with my left hand i'm a right handed surgeon the eye is still firm one the other one is about a 180 degree cross and the third incision for the main so if you lose a chamber f at any of the incision if after first incision you lose it you can go ahead put an helon inside do the next procedure and once the eyes form again and come back again and do the incisions so you but you before you do a rexus i think it's best to have all the three incisions in place okay all right so once that is done you can use a uh, one in uh, 100000 you can have a edri which is a intracameral one diluted the moment you put a dash it opens up okay so then you put in a air put a little dye in the center okay and take out the dye from all the openings so that way you mark the openings you have the incision here incision here so when you going in with the instruments you won't be damaging the epithelium or the endothelium you know precisely where they are and you won't damage the cornea much and i think the trifen blue works like a cross linking of the anterior capsule and changes and changes the nature of the capsule and makes it more uh, manageable for, for rexus purpose okay all right so rexus size is 5 mm what that's what is the standard and what and that is going to decide your your future of the eye if your size of the anterior capsule is big the lens might come anterior if it's too small there could be a fibrosis and so the anterior posterior rexus both sizes are very important and there's always a contraction if you follow this patient after 2 3 years there's a contraction to, to the 5 to 10 percent it becomes smaller so please do not make too smaller rexus and don't make too bigger rexus so that the lens start keeps coming anterior 
okay so how you do five this is the if you can see my uh, 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 this is a callisto microscope it's showing me the five millimeter so my rex is right inside that one so that's pretty good so if you don't have this microscope you can use the old refines you can put it in the cornea mark the cornea and do it uh, uh, Mary Tessigan from Belgium uses a silicon ring. As, she inserts a silicon ring from a 2.2 incision and she does her X in between. I have that ring, but uh, I, I don't feel comfortable with that. So I, I basically use a microscope. And the other technique is if you can see the nucleus of this patient, majority of the nucleus, the 95% are between 4.5 to 5.5. So if you see the nucleus here, and majority of these will be 4.5 to 5.5. The moment it dilates, you notice that and please dilate all these patients because it tells you where I am I. Anyway, you've seen that one. It'll come in the video also. Next one also. Uh, -uh. wait. What happened? I clicked too often, huh? Sorry, you guys have to wait for me. I mean, I think this is hanging a bit. Come on, come on. I can have a question in between if somebody wants to add on. Uh, Sumita, you want to add on something till now, and then I can start again. I think it's, it's going to love, so far, Sumita. So Sorry. far, you have covered everything very nicely. Yeah, but I think I double clicked it, so I have to wait for this too. I'm sorry. Most remarkable is your pre-op documentation. I think love, uh, that's the most important because doing the surgery, I think anybody can pick it up because it's, it's not a, it's not a great because the yeah. nucleus, you don't need a FACO. You just, you can actually go with the 18 gauge cannula and suck it out. That was my senior used to do. Uh, I, I'm sure Dr. Titial remembers those days, uh, GAOT with the capsule acne faucet. It used to have a claw in the front and capsule. Mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll start it again. Dr. Titial, you want Ogawa, to Ogawa, you know, aspiration capsule. Yeah, cannula. Yes. So yes, you Gawa was go inside and aspirate in one go. <laughs> My God! Uh, actually, those are you know, two stage surgery. Actual two stage surgery on extra capsule, you know. So basically, need, needing an aspiration described way back. Yeah, I, I think I'll go back on this one. It's just it's, it's hanged, you know. Just wait for some time, please. Yeah, I'll just do it again. I think it'll be fine. Uh, I'm still on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I will go back again and do it. Uh, I think that I need to change the system now because this system is fully loaded with so many videos. Uh, mm -hmm. See, without videos, uh, it doesn't work uh, because you actually show them what you're doing. I mean, that, I think that's the most important thing about. And the other thing I have to get up. All right. So. I'm there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll just rush down, please. I should not click too often. That's why it gets stuck. And the thing is, uh, love, you all can have it, provided you give extra. You see, after my clinic, we used to spend more time on getting the pictures and data of these patients. And I used to tell the parents, I'll admit the patient only if I've seen both the parents. Most of the time, the uncle will come, the grandparent will come with the child. So I made it a point to see both the parents and majority of the patients we see, uh, but uh, there are certain cases in which we have to flip, give it a go, but uh, try not to do that if, if you can. I think I'll have to go through this all entire again. So, all right. Okay. All right. So size decided now how to go about it. I think this is a video which I, I show every time. And I think this is the only video which actually people should learn. So what you need to do is that's the anterior capsule. That's a posterior capsule. So if you overfill the anterior capsule, it will go flatter. And that's what you want. And posterior capsule, if you overfill, the convexity will go further away. And we don't want that. I had only two runaways in my entire career of the posterior capsule rexes. And that were those myopic patients. I overfilled the chamber. And the moment I gave a nick. Okay. So I coming from the main incision, because main incision is a little bigger incision. Always make uh, incision a little bigger, the main one. I'll tell you why. One, the viscoelastic comes, uh, the air comes out easily and doesn't go get trapped. And I come from the side make an incision which is vertical now i'm going with a 2.2 incision here and put my utrata forces so the beginners i think utrata forces is a fantastic force and this measurement is about a five millimeter across so you can use this as your uh, guide so i think easily anybody who starts a surgery can do a caliper check and do i think love if you can have a data we can pull in i've done must have done thousands of them then i realized that i actually don't need anything to measure 
the nucleus most of the time it happens there and why it happens there don't ask me that question because i i think i'm very really smart i've done so many but i think the more i know about it i know how ignorant uh, how, how less i know so that's about a five millimeter the trick was to grasp again and again the most important thing was to overfill the entire chamber for god's sake that has to be done otherwise you'll get in trouble it'll run away the same surgery i'm doing with a uh, methyl cellulose now this is not helon that was helon and you notice my incision is too small when my incision is small my viscoelastic whichever i put will trap the air inside and i'm using a longer forcep which is good to work in the retina because it's deeper inside when you're working in the anterior chamber you very close to the uh, the cornea back of the cornea whereas the iscaris comes in so you have to hold it more often and go all around I used to use the MSG forceps, then I, I it broke off. Then I've started using these uh, forceps, which are the retinal forceps, which are routine ones, which are disposable ones, and which I share the OT with the retina colleagues. So I, I have enough of these forceps. So that's not an issue. So I have to be more careful, and I can get a rexis done here also. And this was a patient with a, if you remember, Unerman Conradi syndrome. If you see this eye, you can never forget. I think. You people should all go and revise your Honeman Conradi. But you can get a rexis with that also. But the only thing is you, your control has to be more. I'm holding the left, uh, with the left hand, I'm holding the eye throughout. Whereas with the Utrata forceps, I, I can just leave with one hand, I can manage it. Okay, so hydro, after that is a hydro. Hydro is, uh, again, in the adults, you take out the viscoelastic and do the hydro. Here you do the hydro without removing the viscoelastic. So basically, you basically want the layer of the fluid to go in presence of the fluid and of the OVD and it cuts. So see, it's, it actually goes and cuts around. It's something like you're using a femto to actually cut it. Some viscoelastic will definitely come out, but don't let the chamber go shallow. Okay. Then you can do the aspiration, a coaxial aspiration, or you can go for a biomanual. So that's the advantage of biomanual. So I had two incision on the side, one in the main incision. And I go with a, I use this MSG forceps. Uh, the trick is not the MSG force. So the trick is your incision has to be compatible with the incision. If your incision and the bore size are different, then you have a leaky wound. And then the chamber will shallow and you can have a bad cornea later on and refer to one of the Iskris colleagues. But now you, if your incision is tight and these are metal instruments, so it is not going to collapse. Even if it's a little tighter, it's better. So I polished the other end. Now I change my hands. You see the chamber going shallow. It's like a myopic eye. But this is what I was telling you. There's low sclerogenity in these patients, pediatric patients. Now I come from the other side. My infusion comes from the other side. And this uh, uh, diamond dusted one comes from the left hand. And I take out the cortex. And you can take out 360. I think our aspiration is much better. We take out all the cortex. That's why maybe the glaucoma and all these problems in a patient is much less. And this rex is about a 5 millimeter. So that's good. Okay, now coming to the PCC, again, the picture comes in because it's a posterior capsule now, so you don't have to overfill it. So you, have, you can put the viscoelastic in the chamber, in the anterior chamber, so that when you go, you don't touch the iris, you don't rub against the iris, and maybe a little blog in the center, and that's about it. Do not overfill it, do not push it backwards. And I don't stain the posterior capsule because posterior capsule as such is a five micron uh, game. So if you make it more brittle, it will break off. The moment you hold it, it will come to the forceps only. And again, the same procedure comes from the side, give a neck. Now I'm more confident of using the longer forceps here because the nucleus has gone out. I've got that much three, 3.5 millimeter extra zone. Now you see, I'm holding with the forceps, pulling it up in the center, rotating. And every time you're using a, a long forceps, you hold the eye with the left hand. You see, I removed that grip now because I'm confident at this stage that I can manage it with that, right? And if you notice, my incision is big. Love and Smitha always make an incision bigger when you're using a longer forceps. Otherwise, what happens, the knuckle gets stuck. So most of the time, I've seen people struggling with the knuckle. If you see this one, this goes in so well, and the knuckle, this knuckle actually gives you trouble sometimes if it's a small incision. And then you can turn your hand. Now, because the incision is 2.2, I can actually rotate my hand all 360 degrees inside and get it. Now, it will never run off if you don't overfill it. And you have to hold it more often. And this is a, you can use the end grasping force. You can use like a micro force. Even the upper uh, people have a force. You can use it. So that's how the posterior axis is done. And uh, avoid the, uh, so you can use your axis uh, either with a fork. You can eat your noodles with a fork or a chopsticks. But you 
will become expert. When I went to China, I had a fork which was folded fork in my pocket. I couldn't eat the noodles with that. But when I came back, I was pretty good with my chopsticks. So long forces versus a longer, shorter forces that helps you. Vitrectomy, I think, is a must for most of the patient because two things: one, you're reducing the VO because you remo remove the scaffold from the side. Second, you're putting an adult lens into a smaller child's eye. So when you do not vitrectomy, the bag opens up a little more and takes this one. None of the companies making smaller lenses. Every time people say you request them, they don't listen because I don't think it's financially viable for those guys. So it reduces the VO formation, it reduces the IO pupillary capture because if the lens falls backwards, it will not come anterior and get captured. And the secondary glaucoma has reduced you know, in all our patients in which we've done a proper vitrectomy. So I think that's a trick to the uh, the eye surgery. So these are my setups uh, for the centurion. When I'm doing the eye cut, my cut rate is 100. And when we're cutting vitrectomy, it's 4,000. I'm very happy with this machine. No financial interest though. And uh, when you do a vitrectomy, this is what you're supposed to do. And the question every time asked is, what is the end point of the vitrectomy? End point is when the rexis which you created is, is the same shape which you created. Now, I'll tell you what I mean. If you notice, the vitreous is getting going to get hydrated. It always gets hydrated because it's exposed. When you cut it, all the fluid is going inside. You see the, uh, the capsule has, uh, pushway capsule has got distorted because of vitreous. Then you go and cut it. Keep cutting it, keep cutting it till the rexis shape is same. And then... I, in fact, chain my hands and go under the posterior capsule with the cutter facing downwards and cut 360 degrees. So there's no scaffold in that one. And this falls back and the bag opens up. So this is a good end point. And if you, Stramisolone, you can use definitely, but be prepared for the spike in the pressure. I, I don't use it more often. So whenever my resident calls me, the thing is complete. It's always a good idea to put a dash of uh, uh, kinocot inside the tricot. And you can see the vitreous uh, still there and then you can cut it off and do it. Okay. The second uh, thing which we added on uh, in all the patients is we do a uh, examination of the retina in patients right on the table. So most of these patients are one month, two months, three months old with a cataract. Nobody has seen their retina. So you must be the first person to document. So take the picture, give it to the parent, and you can tell them this is the problem. So this is a patient and is, is a PFP. So what we do is in these patients, uh, we put in the viscoelastic in the eye, and then we put a ELU and a reverse we. Uh, Go to the posterior mode and that's what you can see a pfb stock there right and we published this work and uh, you can have normal funders you can have glucometers this you can have all the funny things and i'll show you a few funnies here also so you can pick up these cards and you can actually document them otherwise we couldn't we didn't have anything to image and right there it's sterile zone and we have a illuminators which are sterile so you can actually take it up and take pictures so all our patients now for the last couple of years have all pictures with them of the retina and whenever they come back to us we can always evaluate you don't have to actually take the illu all the way into the vitreous you can stay in the in the bag also and it's a it's a it's a light chandler which goes and you can pick it up so dr ramajit wanted to try this in the, some glaucoma patient without opening the posterior capsule so we did that uh, we did the lens uh, aspiration and we left the posterior capsule in the bag also with the light we could go and pick up all the cuppings uh, so that's a good test you should do now once you decide to put in the lens i think the important thing is how to put the lens in this patient with the anterior capsule posterior capsule both open and how to calculate the oil power i think after that i'll close it up so you have a donut now you have anterior capsule posterior capsule please do not put the lens from 2.2 you are not going to use a wound assisted insertion at all in this patient rather now what I'm doing is I'm pulling, putting the bag back. I'm overfilling the uh, the the periphery of the bag now, so that the posterior capsule goes back. I enlarge the section to 2.8. My tip of my cartridge has to go in, and my lens is going inside, and it's delivered into the bag. But the trailing tip actually goes and tips upwards. So it's something like an aeroplane which is coming to land. It comes with the nose down, but ne nose never touches. It's a hind wheel which touches because it goes up. So that's what the technique is. So you go into the bag. The moment you go into the bag, the, the leading uh, haptic should actually face upwards and hit the back surface of the anterior capsule. So the back surface, the posterior surface of the anterior capsule is where you should actually take support. So if you're using that technique, even if the posterior X is not contiguous, it's nicked off here and there, you can still manage to put the lens in the bag in majority of the patient. But this is what I'm trying to tell you. This is the nose has gone into the vitreous. Sorry. Can I carry on? Dr. Titiala, are you coming? Okay, so you can uh, put the nose, uh, this has gone into the vitreous. So if the lens touches the vitreous and comes out, it will have some tags coming in and it will not do the same. You'd have to do the vitrectomy and clear it up again. And this is uh, coming into the anterior chamber and this is a very smooth landing. You see this anterior tip has gone into the periphery of the bag and uh, landed very well. Uh, this we published uh, a long back actually. So why do you want to change the power? Why can't you give the power at the age of two years, whatever the power is there, or maybe at the one year? 
There won't be any need of glasses. There'll be uh, less amblyopia. But the problem is these eyes, you can't control the growth of these eyes. So they will grow up. If they grow to the extent of plus minus four diopter, it's pretty good. But the majority of them will not. It'll go out of hand. So it's best to try to find out what is the uh, kind of shift you have in your in your hands and go ahead. And why, why is it important is because the eye grows the, uh, the maximum in the first six months. So first six months could be a little iffy. Especially the first three months are the most problematic one, but after that you can actually uh, re uh, define your own nomograms and do it. In the first six months, it's 0.6 millimeters per month. 0.6 into 6 becomes 3.6. That means 3.6 millimeter growth of the eye happens, which in diopter terms becomes a huge amount. And after that, from six months, it's very moderate, 0.19, which actually is not much. And after five years, you actually you can actually use the emetropic powers also. So the growth will depends on the age at what intervention is done. If you left the patient with the iola with the fakia, which lens you put? Rigid lenses will grow more because they cause irritation to the silly body also. So basically, the silly body and the peripheral blur, which will cause more of the change in the protein proteinases and metalloproteinases at the scleral level and cause elongation. So I mean, there are lots of studies to be done on that, but there's nothing much available in the literature. And unilateral versus bilateral also is a big game because both are, they're going to behave very differently. If you're doing a rehabilitation properly with the patching, yes, the growth is not that fast. If the growth, if patching is not done in this patient and they're still seeing blurred and not using glasses, the eye will grow faster. If the patient has glaucoma, of course, the eye is going to grow more. I did one work paper with uh, Vinay Gupta in which we published and which realized that the patient with the IOP, if it's high, excellence is more, your undercorrection has to be much higher because otherwise, uh, all are going to myopia and last not the least is the genetics ones and which i will go where nobody can tell so earlier the uh, the all the formulas used were by prost and the hun they had pretty high hyperopia. They used to do undercorrection a big way, like less than two years were 20% and two to eight years were 10%. We realized that two to eight years, 10% was always staying myopic. They're not coming out of the, of the hyperopia, sorry. So, uh, Wilson did a survey in which he realized that we should, less than six months, you should do high to moderate hyperopia is what you should look at. And depending on the age, with the, around five years, you should do a mild hyperopia. So I think this in, in Yadi's formula actually works pretty good. We realized that whatever study we've done, this is very close to the target. So age plus refraction is seven. So if it's a three-year-old kid, refraction, refractive error should be about four. So three plus four becomes seven. So with that in mind, we did a study in our uh, cohort of the patient. We had a 147 patient in this. We had four groups in each group. So we had less than six months, six to 12 years, 12 years to two years, and two years to two, five years, and more than five years. In each patient, we realized what uh, was the excellent keratometry. So this was the data of biometry, and this was the power calculated. And then what, whatever we put there, with the existing knowledge and we checked out the residual power later on after six months of the follow-up we realized where were the mistake and what could have been corrected so we came up with a nomogram which decides some, something like this now so if it's a five-year-old child more than five years you don't have to do under correction to so whatever power you're getting uh, for example if you're getting say 27.25 you can't have a 2.5 so in that one you do a under correction of 0.25 and take a 27 power so first uh, under correction in the lens power in, in, in the availability of the lens, I'm saying, because the lenses don't come in the power of a 2.25 jump. They come in a 0.5 jump. And if you higher the power you get, they come with a one adapter jump. Lower and higher one will come with a one power jump, not a 0.5. So most majority of these kids will need higher power, say, say, say 28, 29, 30, 31, 34. And the jump is of one. So you still can do under correction depending on the less available. Between two to five years, it's a 5% under correction, and that's mild hyperopia. That's worked wonderfully well in our hands here. One to two years is 10% under correction. It's moderate. Six months to one year, 15% is perfectly all right in all these patients. Now, the yellow one, three to six months, is 20% under correction, which is high hyperopia, according to us. Less than three months, and if the excellence is less than 17 millimeters, and white to white is less than nine millimeter, please do not put implant. Bilateral aphakia is a very good option. I repeat, in case you don't have uh, biometry setups and all those, you can leave this patient aphakic in both eyes, give them aphakic glasses after refraction. And whenever you get a chance later on, you can put a secondary implant when the eye grows. So this doesn't mean that you put in the lens in all the patient. But if it's a unilateral patient, using a fakia glass in one might not be an answer. If you have a good contact lens setup, you can use a fakia and uh, use contact lenses. That's what the IATS study has talked about. But till six months, uh, three months, we are we're getting pretty good results. And this is what we follow. And the majority of the patients are doing pretty good. Okay. So 
everybody talks about optic capture optic capture if, if you have to do never ever do it with a single piece lens it has to be a multi piece lens or a rigid lens and uh, i do routinely for the eyes which are bigger eyes if the ophthalmic eye which is globe is big single piece lens will keep rotating inside so i do that one uh, i think I'll, i'll skip that now i'll just show you some one or two videos of the capture and i think we have enough oh, it's already past eight sorry so this is a one in which uh, uh, rexus was not contiguous so it you plan and put this lens into the sulcus you putting it in the sulcus rotate it and then just to optic capture with the sun so capture here and capture on the other side okay now this was a patient in which we had to do a reverse capture because the lens was put into the bag and after the during that we realized that the posterior capsule has run off so one option was to take this lens out entirely from the bag and put it into the sulcus and do it but we what we did was we captured it with the anterior capsule since the angulation with the haptics which is 5 deg 15 degrees angulation anteriorly even if you capture with the anterior capsule it does not cause a pupillary capture three piece lenses can never be put upside down because of the angulation if you put it upside down you will always have a optic capture pupillary capture and you get into trouble please do not put this lens upside down if it's upside down it has to be corrected asap on the table itself so this is what a follow up of this patient looks like now if the patient comes to us with a fakia yeah, there is no support anywhere we use ac lenses i i use a lot of them and uh, not all of them were bad the only problem was the sizing so the, they were available in two sizes which is 12.5 and 13 so if your sizing is less than 10 mm uh, cd uh, white to white uh, more than 12.5 these lenses will not do well now this was a technique which uh, we developed with the under air you can put the lenses so all these lenses in which your sizing is correct i've been following them for 15 20 years they're doing pretty good but if the sizing is a issue they can rotate and cause endothelium of the cornea so my, my cornea colleagues didn't take it very well so i in fact stop doing them now but if i get a adult also if i get a maybe a 10 year an adult uh, bigger than that and if there's this lens available and there's no option you can do it provided you do a pi and provided the lens measurement is correct because measurement is the most important so since the measurement and all the lenses are not available uh, i i also given up this technique so i put a suture there and I always do a pi please don't leave this patient without a pi because it's a ticking time bomb because it will cause a pupillary capture and you you will have lost eye so pi is a must and you come from the side come and do a small pa and that's that's what it looks like okay so this was again published long back now this is what is what we doing for the last 3 years we doing a retro fixated iris flow i think there's a last video and if you see this is a subluxated lens and i'm sure the sclera is going to be thin in this one so once i done a lens sec me i made my opening in the center it's a 5.2 mm opening the most important step is i'm going to show you now which is the opening the side port entry so when i'm making two side ports i take my blade all the way in and you see what angle this one is facing to a 7 o'clock the other one on the side will be facing it the 5 o'clock and that is because the needle i used for enclave will go from there and it, it's uh, ergonomically much easier to handle this one so once i made this one lens goes in now this is a indian variety of lens this is not an important lens we use uh, the uh, uh, verisys also but they're not available these days so we started using these indian lenses which comes for 1000 i think 1200 1500 rupees and they're doing pretty good actually so in the initial time we had little deinclavation but we got the trick and trade and we settled this down so first you put it in the front of the iris at the place where you want to park then i hold firmly with my right hand and you see my needle is gone in i bring the lens upwards it, it has an impression against the iris and tuck it and that's it it and then coming from the other side holding the lens first it's always better to put in the needle along so that you can actually manipulate the lens to where you want to you so my left hand is not moving much now and once it comes you see the impression there and tuck it and that's it and then you of course suture it up the main incision is 5.2 you have to suture it uh, in the adults when i do i make a scleral tunnel because this was a subluxated lens a scleral sense so we 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 didn't do a scleral tunnel we do the uh, limbal only and once this is done this is what it looks like uh, one or two patients of the uh, uh, glue iris uh, in the in these uh, marfan patients had come run, done somewhere in south india i don't know which center so, but the 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 haptic has come out so we had to put a scleral flap in this one on the a scleral patch on this one so you can do it if your thickness is good otherwise i think you should avoid these ones okay so coming to the uh, iol power traction is it's like an adult is a, is a sit, sitting target but when you're doing in a pediatric uh, you have to take a little pinch of salt because there's so many things which you have to take in consideration for example this young gentleman is doing a surgery but he missed the target he missed the target totally so 
once he has a knowledge of growth of the eye and he's been following his patient properly he knows how much which which eye is growing how much so once he takes into consideration and then he can get a bullseye so maybe after this talk all of you will be getting a bullseye so i'll just wrap it up here so small patients will need more patients you have to be more patient give more time to these patients and that's how it works and if you have a time if you allow me i, I can do a rehabilitation otherwise i think uh, you have to do occlusion treatment in these patients unilateral ones bilateral ones don't need a rehabilit uh, occlusion but they need contact lenses or glasses even after the iol because you left them under corrected and if you pick up a vo and glaucoma in this patient be very aggressive about that because otherwise you're going to lose these eyes totally so with those things uh, rehabilitation refraction follow up and each follow up so i put a suture i don't use absorbable suture because i call them after four weeks at that time i do the pressure check up on these eyes do a refraction so that way we tend to get more data so i think you need to have more patient in this patient and you can get away with that uh, thank you very much guys and i'm so glad you gave me an opportunity to speak on this forum of uh, uh, cornea se section but uh, i think uh, if you do the surgery well you 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 will need the corneal surgeons less often thank you thank you sir that was a fantastic master class uh, real master of pediatric cataract surgery uh, we have the two panelists dr love dr smita uh, can we have some comments from you definite uh, it was very good sir one question i had what is the maximum i will power can you share the oh sorry 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 uh, i'm sorry i'm so sorry stop. Yeah. what is the maximum uh, iol power you implant in children mm. see in single piece and, and and three piece one has 30 one has 34 so mm. there's no option <laughs> that's the maximum because i talked to this company guys to give me lenses they say when the lens thickness goes up the central uh, the point spread function goes haywire so they can't make it so tricks of putting two lenses putting one piggy back with the smaller and we just finished a thesis in which we realized that we measured the is normalized and the traumatic uh, the cataract has high also and the glaucoma patients also we realized that the bag diameter of indian is are never more than 99.5 mm i'm talking the bag diameter even very rare to get 9.5 also even if the white to white is 11 the bag is smaller in this eye so if you want in the bag 12.5 if you don't have vitrick me if you don't do a vitrick me and do a posterior opening the haptics will not open also in one side the haptics you must have seen those ones so putting two lenses there uh, is a big no so sulcoflex i'm going to i'm planning one patient who's 8 year old in which i'm going to put a sulcoflex next week but i'm very skeptical about it one they can't afford the imported sulcoflex they're putting a indian one and i'm prepared if it doesn't work i'll take it out so it's too much of crowding there so your answer to the question is 30 and 34 depending single and uh, three piece we don't have powers more than that piggy back might not be a good answer in these patients you want to add on something about piggy backs please go ahead so just related to that uh, what about nanophthalmic eyes yeah nanophthalmic eyes we is putting iris claw lenses because uh, the bag is smaller there's one more technique i can tell you which i started using for the eyes in which the bag is smaller but it's still about 7.5 to 8 mm so what we do is we do a lensectomy uh, and we leave the central 6 mm open we put a three piece lens in the sulcus with the optic capture throughout so that's what we started doing i've done about a 25 eyes now and all are doing good about the last 6 months my anxiety was that i'll share it only to the people who are doing these surgeries because they know what i'm doing if a general guy starts doing it they might get into a problem so if it's a smaller eye say about a 9 8 mm across and your bag is uh, about 7.5 you just open the central rexus about a 5 mm and you can actually capture with the haptics in the sulcus three piece lens of course single piece yeah. is a big no in a nanothermic eyes you should never do that yes. so because of the you know small axial length the iol power is also quite high so, yeah. so in such cases uh, yeah what? rajesh the is issue is the smaller the eye the bigger is the refractive error so even if you give them the fak glasses they're going to be what 36 diopters and with the nose not developed the child can't even hold it. the the glasses are bigger than the heavier than the head in fact if you see the patient from the side rajesh with the biconvex lenses some patients can't even open the lids because the lashes rub against the hand for that so I I, for the iol because these iols high powered iols even if you custom, custom these are custom made they are very thick lenses 
and I don't believe in that. Uh, customize, I think 30, 30 and 34 diaper, more than that, you should not use because the point spread function and all these problems have come into play. I know certain mm -hmm. who are taking bigger, thicker lenses, they can customize, but not for the pediatric eyes. No, I will not do that. I'll give them the glasses, whatever errors there in the glasses. Uh, Smitha, how do you react to that? You want to use the say 40 adapter if they give you? Uh, unmute, please. Unmute. Uh, uh, unmute. Smitha, yes. No, I, I, I would not. I would not. Uh, a clean application at any time better than anything else. Yesterday Perfect. only I saw a patient operated maybe three, four years mm -hmm. back by me. And plus 30 was implanted and still wearing plus seven, plus eight. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we, yeah, we have done a work on nanophthalmos. We found children with nanophthalmos is very rare. Very rare. Yeah. In fact, yeah. uh, in our series of... Uh, 75 children with none of them was none of them had cataract. In fact, they had an angle closure more often than what yeah. we anticipated, but cataract was not there. And adults, yeah, yeah so I, I don't think the true definition of none of them was in children, yeah, yeah. cataract is that common. I have published that on, yeah, in JPOS, and we didn't find yeah, yeah. cataract. No, I've read an article of yours. See, if it's a yeah. nanophthalmus, it's a normal eye which is smaller. That is what is a nanophthalmus. But I'm talking about a microphthalmus cataract syndrome in which the yes. eye is smaller. Yes. In those yeah. ones, I'm talking about. Those ones, not, yes. I think those, uh, those. Rajesh, nanophthalmus is not a good term because nanophthalmus means that anatomy is small. And then, rest is all good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, think, that, yeah, that's true. I mean, that's what I meant because people have okay. uh, shown videos of nanophthalmic uh, cataracts putting, you know, somebody putting customized lenses of, uh, you know, very high adapters, somebody putting... I, I will yeah. not recommend that, please. Yeah, somebody putting okay. that lens in that. So, I, in any case, I mean, if the, the, the space is less, putting a piggyback yeah. lens, I don't know how much is advisable. No, for no, children... I, I, no, sorry, please. Subita, please go ahead. Sorry. Sumita, we lost you. Uh, so I yeah. think uh, we've lost our connection. We got Namrata. Namrata can take over the question. Uh, <laughs> we had to have a lady on the board. <laughs> no, sir, you can answer the question. I'm no, sure. no, uh, there's no question. She was putting a thing. I, yeah. I agree with her. There's no point in putting yeah. high power. Uh, one, like, one question, one more question I have, sir. Uh, sure, please, love. Go ahead. Do, some children, the capsular phimosis occurs. Is there any pre-op assessment in which we can predict... Uh, that in whom it will happen or not. In spite of a good 5 millimeter excess, but once they come, yeah. maybe one or two years later, the visual excess has got opacified, even the anterior capsule. Yeah, see, anterior capsule is opacifying 100% of the patients, but how much is the contracture is what we talk about. Contracture to the center. If, if you got a 5 millimeter, there was a study which I read in which they, they did, did 6 millimeter excess so that it, uh, even contracts covers, but the lens comes anterior. So we don't want that also. So rexus should never be more than 5.5. It should be central. So what you need to do is make a smaller rexus, do the procedure, put the implant in, and anterior rexus can, you can define it later on, actually. You can actually, you know, make a neck and make it uh, mm -hmm. so 5.5. So all the, of them will become opaque and posterior rings also become opaque. You but can't fibrosis, control. central uh, contracture of the, uh, five, if, if in a 5 millimeter rexus, have you seen? So some See, of my cases I've seen. I, I, I'll tell you, if you have a patient of PFB, persistent fetal vasculature, in which there was a, a PPM in the front and there were blood vessels there, or it, it is a rubella case, in those ones, because of the uveitis, you can have some inflammation which induces the contracture, which actually is not a contracture, it's a membrane in the front. It's a cocooning, it's in the front. So we have seen those ones, but in those patients only, in which there's a uh, RS was handled, it's a PFB or a, 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 or a rubella cases. Otherwise, most of these cases are clean cases and uh, the central part doesn't get affected. Of course, the ring will become opaque in the periphery, but not the central part. So I'll again tell one more th the thing that when your surgery is over on the table, and if you think your entire capsule is smaller, that you still have the patient under GA, Please make neck and just go around slow multiple and you can do a rexis again in this one. And, and, and it's, it Even with the cutter, we can uh, high speed cutting, we can do. Yes, huh? I, I use the manual other one, but yes, you can use the cutter also. Yes. At the end, you can use cutter fine because you're not going to manipulate the lens. Yes. Uh, I, I was in the US last month and they one guy published a paper that he says he's doing anterior posterior rexis both with a cutter and he puts uh -huh. all the lens in the back. You were there? Yeah, if they, uh, one one had come for a life surgery to Calcutta. He had done like that. Mm. But then how do you put the lens in the bag? I mean, 
must be a great surgeon. I'm, I'm, no, no, so one can't. But the risk of extension is definitely there. Hundred percent. Rajesh, Rajesh, this is smaller back. With this twenty-three gauge cutters, you can do it. It's very. Of course, regular. you can do it. Smitha, you can do it, but if you can do a Rexis, you can control with the lens coming in the back single piece. That is the idea. What, I mean, what, what, about, what about the optic capture with the uh, in these cases Maybe. where you do Rexis with the vitrectomy probe? Mm, can you yeah, do that? Guys, you want to respond? <laughs> I have the one Rexis which is manual anterior or posterior for capture. I will not capture it with the with the with the one which it's is under, under the lens. There's a fibrosis which is in the capsule already there. Yeah. Then what I do is I make an opening inside and leave a fibrotic rim around it. Then I yeah. can do whatever. You can do a capture, yeah. and those eyes will are the best because it's not going to fibrosis not going to happen again. It's already there, and the center part stays clear. So I have a set of patients for for publication. Once it comes, I'll share that with you with the with the yeah. pasties, and we they're doing wonderfully well. Sir, one category you didn't mention, UVIT sure, no. pediatric cataracts. Yeah, what about that? <laughs> Okay, so rubella patients, most of them will be non-dilating pupil, small pupil, absorbed cataract. Lenses are already absorbed; they're opening anterior posterior. So the, if you see the volume of on the ultrasound, it's gone. UBM, it's gone down. So in most of these patients, you might have to cut the pupil also. Initial days, I was very skeptical about cutting the pupil. Then I realized when these patients come back, they'll have a block. There'll be a pupillary block. There'll be a sinicia. There'll be seclusive pupil kind of picture. So I. In case my pupil is small, say about two three millimeter, I always eat up the sphincters all three sixty degrees to make them about a four four point five, and when they come for follow up, that stays there, and the capsule actually decides how much light is going in. So capsule yeah. about four millimeter, then you can get away with that. But yeah, you're right. I, one uh, one comment about this three sixty degree sure. cutting pupil, because sure. I feel sometimes the, it causes a really persistent uh, dilatation and and glare. So I think yeah. even if you have to cut the pupil, I would not recommend doing 360 degrees. It's probably good to do it in one quadrant, and that will give you enough. No, yes, Mita, we have followed all follow of these patients. We realize that the, once the reaction settles down, it, entire thing comes and becomes famous. Mm -hmm. Have you got these patients coming back to you, especially yes. the rub? I'm talking yes, rubella yes, one. Yes, yes, we have follow up with rubellas. Not so if you if you do a cutting with a high speed one. It's basically it's a fantastic cutting. If it just takes a very small, I mean all these. Yes. Uh, no, I agree. I'm saying only cutting 360 degree is probably not. How, how much do you recommend? Where do you where do you? Maybe a just a quadrant. Degree. Just a quadrant. So you go for the inferior quadrant, inferior yes. temporal, inferior nasal. Yes. Infrotail, infranasal, most. So you're doing a, a, a <laughs> optical. Yeah, I will so, usually use a hook, and you should it stays uh, stays uh, okay with that. Hook. I have not. My on experience the, is different from you. The, on the table, hooks will work fine. I agree with you. No, no. But after what, what come out. Uh, I beg to differ here. Fair enough. The thing is, it's not just the pupil which is there. The capsule of the anterior capsule, if it gets fibrous, and if you haven't cut it properly, even that will come and block. So what I'm saying is that you can open the pupil, but don't open the capsule that big. So your light yeah. is still going to be blocked with the with the capsular anterior fibrous. That's what I was trying to say that time. So when okay. Love asked me, I asked, I told him, so if you think the pupil, if the patient comes to me as a follow up with a stuck down pupil, I'll eat it up. So what happens? Is normally, the sinicia is in the center, and there's always a hump a millimeter away from the center. If you notice, I think you must have seen there's more people thing gets gathered, so it's already raised up. So you put a cutter just at that point and just go 360. It just gives you about a three millimeter, four millimeter opening, and that's fantastic. Don't make it five six there. No, uh, that's one one bad point. experience. I I agree that uh, removing the sinicia manually. To some it's extent, it's fine, but if it is a broad base, better best to avoid. No. You, mm. Yes, you have to cut it. Mm. Do not pull okay. there because you break I, the. I, I ended up with uh, on-table retinal detachment in one child when I tried that. Oh, mm. No, no, cutter is the best because you're cutting with the tip down and with a high-speed cut with a low suction mm. rate. You can actually yeah. you're nibbling it. I think uh, Rajesh can uh, agree with that because he's a retinal. He done a VR course also properly. Mm -hmm. It actually goes so smooth with a high cut rate with this Centurion yeah. four thousand. I think I'm comfortable. What I'm saying is this is what I do. Okay, and I started doing after doing it for twenty five thirty years now. So I'm just putting it across for the people who are actually But, doing uh, this. Sir, one question about that: Doesn't sure. uh, the blood ooze out of from that and then say, at the center uh, no, no, gets no, accumulated? No, 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 no. no. Mm -hmm. no. See, blood will. Uh, There's another hypothesis. Uh, I can ask you a question now. The, why does the microthalamic eye the bleed when you do a PI? 
I think most of the you say microthalamic eyes when you operate, you do a PI, it bleeds. Mm. So we under we done few patients on this one. We realized that these are the eyes which have stopped growing up. So these are still having the persistent, uh, the uh, prolonged, uh, elongated uh, cilia process in the periphery. So when you do a PI, you are actually nicking off the cilia processes at the back. So we done a retro elimination to this patient. We realized that the processes are still coming there. And on the UBM, we realized that the processes in the microthermic size are still around 360. I didn't want to share this. This was basically for the pediatric group only. So general population was listening to it. Uh, they can actually ignore it. So yes, so that's why the PI, if you do a mid peripheral, it will not bleed. If you go peripheral, it's because you are damaging the ciliary process at the back which are elongated in this one. So with the next time you do you smaller eyes, please do a UBM and we can share this data. Love you too. Yes, sir. I mean, I you too, love. I will not put the lens at all, sir. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> I'm not talking about the lens. I'm talking about the, uh, the cortical removal and PIs in this patient. If it's a smaller microthalmic eye, of course, you're going to do a PI in this patient, isn't it? Shallow chamber. So when you do a PI, just ensure that if you do a mid-peripheral, your bleeding mm. will be less. So mid-peripheral and central. PI also. I don't do Sorry? PI. I don't do PI. If you are doing a vitrectomy and you are doing anterior capsular excess with posterior capsular excess, you don't need a PI. Because PI is not small good. Eyes. Small eyes, he's telling. Small yeah, eye I, I won't do it in small eyes also. I'm not you have nanothalmic eyes which are, don't have any you know, cataracts, so you won't have a glaucoma also. No, but I no, think no. Uh, I'll make a different thing because I think I'm all small eyes, my... I'll do a PI. <laughs> I'm talking about microthalmas. I don't do PI. I don't do PI. Okay. okay. No, but we do in smaller eyes. We do, especially for unilateral uh, love. If the unilateral uh, smaller eye, I'm putting yes, in sir, the sulcus. Always do a PI in this one because you don't know which terrain you are, and majority of them uh, will do pretty good actually. And you need occlusion treatment. Unilateral eye cataracts are a big mess actually. You know, mm. you think you've done a great job, but then the patient comes without glasses or occlusion treatment. It's a disheartening thing actually. I have few patients who come from abroad to follow up for unilateral cataracts. They've got six nine vision, but then the <laughs> parents have to be educated. It's the parents who can afford, who can understand. Most of the people will not. The other eye is the child is seeing, and the child cries when you occlude the other eye. They'll stop the occlusion. It's as simple as that. Mm. And all your goes down. So when I operate this patient, my first thing is parents that they will not interfere with my treatment. Sudarshan, <laughs> uh, Sudarshan, one uh, query. Yeah. Uh, like uh, many patients do require, you know, secondary intervention uh, when you have. Uh, Visual access, uh, access oppressive patient. And uh, despite you do a uh, no primary posterior capsular yeah. access, vitrectomy, yes, many yes. these pediatric patients will develop a membrane, then it requires uh, management. Uh, how do you approach them? Uh, do you go anterior route or do you go for a pass lena uh, route in these cases? Okay. So if it's a, uh, if my anterior access is already logged in onto the top, right? I do a UBM. It probably happens in this case, right? So there are two ways looking. One is an interior view, one is posterior. You can have anterior, which uh, Love was talking about the membrane. Then I go from the interior. So in fact, I make a uh, trocar entry in these patients from the back. And before that, UBM tells you whether it's anterior or posterior. If it's pure posterior, trocar. But my fluid fluid tip I put from the in, in, into the chamber and my lens that goes onto the top of the lens. To I hold the lens. And with a trocar, I with a cutter, I go inside. I do the IA cut first, cortex, and then I do the vitrectomy, put it upside down, clean it up. It takes two minutes. If you want, I can show you the video of that. If people want to see that, I can show you the video videos. Uh, otherwise, we can discuss that fine. And Dr. Titial, if we have an anterior also with that, so one stab anterior also. So once posterior is clear, anterior, first anterior is clear, then the posterior. Okay. And we don't suture it. Yeah. Second, and I know, like, uh, there, there would be a group of patients where you have a pro progressive, you know, excellent progression. Mm -hmm. Or a progressive myopia happening in these cases. Yeah, uh, yeah. Have you noted such cases because you have yes. a, such a large series of cases? Yeah. In my, this thing, I think I still have about five patients in which I don't have the answer. Love, especially. So we did an implant at the age of six months, undercorrected, plus eight for six, seven adapter. Patient came to us after two years. He was emetropic. One year after that, he was minus five. One year after that, he was minus 10. So we removed that lens, we expanded the lens, put another lens. Very good. One year after that, he came with minus five again. So something which triggers at the back. So that is what we don't know. I think so, but not, not too many patients. Not too many yeah, patients. Yeah, that is a difficult scenario. Like I remember publishing a series of 14 cases way back in around 2004 or 5. 
where we mm-hmm. had these as you said the first case came like this as you said you talked yes. about one patient i thought it's my mistake i had to miscalculate the ion power and it changed the yeah. pain and within one year it again went to minus 5 yeah. then we picked yeah. them around 14 15 patient yeah. and uh, most of these patient uh, what we concluded in that either they were unilateral cataracts or second yeah. was uh, we had done a multiple intervention in those cases yes and third was amblyopia so these three yeah. factors were the major contributing for a progressive myopia and one of that, that and this usually happens in unilateral cataract can happen bilateral also but usually unilateral cataract so unilateral cataract is a different uh, different uh, cat- is a different ball game altogether so unilateral if you don't do the occlusion treatment versus occlusion treatment the excellence will change wearing the glasses properly the excellence will change if time of intervention the time the, the earlier you do the more chances of it's elongating so there was a study in which uh, in notney at all and even avaswara has some of the work in which they took unilateral cataracts to see the progression of the eye so only one group said that it did not increase it stayed slow but rest of the group said that it went so fast that it overshot the other eye's excellence also so yeah, out of the eight yeah. studies uh, only one says it's slow rest says it's overshoot even the avaswara paper says it's overshoots that one and i agree with that I think there is the importance to discuss. You know, if you want to uh, under correct those cases, or you want to fully correct these patients at that time, so that they don't get into a you know amblyopia. Because if you under correct these patients, you're going to give a you know uh, you're not going to get a uh, absolutely good vision in this eye. As such, unilateral cases will be difficult. So my theory would be you not know, to give a full correction. If even they develop myopia, you can correct subsequently rather than leaving them. Hyperopic and uh, again putting them into amblyopia. Yeah, but myopia, if you can control it, if your myopia goes to eighty, nineteen, I mean, see what that's the problem. If the one which has gone to five, despite the IOL, he would have gone without eye. He would have jumped more. So uh, yes, but yes, there are one or two person. So these are the outliers. So whenever these patient comes, I give attention to them. I have a, a, sh- a shot of surgery pay exit and how much was there. What is at one year follow up, two year. So I have a, uh, about five patient. I'm following this up and let's see what uh, if we, once we publish, I'll disclose what happens. But yes, you do have. But that doesn't mean that the 99 percent patient who are getting advantage, you leave them alone. So I'll still err oh. on this side and do it because a fakey glasses, they might find one pair. If they break off, they might second pair. After that, even the parents give up after something. Contact lenses, uh, I think we miserably fail on that. And I need to have a setup with the contact lens setup. We had a guy other, from, other, from Lis- other question Lis- which people keep asking is, you know, what about uh, using a multifocal? Uh, now we have a good trifocal lenses. You yeah, know, this uh, you know uh, slightly bigger pediatric age yes. group, or uh, giving them a tonic lenses. Sometimes you know uh, they do have a more than 1.52 cylinder. what is your experience in those areas okay so if the child is more than 10 years you can treat him like a adult and do whatever you want to do but if the child is younger than that and the excellent is still growing multifocal might not be work so the other thing i notice in multifocal is most of the patient which we plan multifocal lenses there was one patient who got one eye done outside so we were forced to put in the other eye and the patient did very well majority of the patient in which i want to put multifocal at the age of say 3 2 3 4 years the cylinder is very high So if the cylinder is high, I can't put a multifocal. If I put a toric multifocal in this age and the age changes, it becomes messy. So I wait till six years minimum for this one. And but what about some them, EDOF lens, EDOF and multifocal? How would you compare? I have used eye hands in patients when the other lens is not available, which is a, a kind of a, a non-diffractive uh, EDOF kind of thing. So EDOF that's the toric one. Yeah, toric they have not come out the toric. Toric do not. But but Chome, I think I'll prefer giving them the glasses than putting a toric lens because I I don't agree with that. After ten years, yes, you can do whatever you want to do. I think you uh, all three have such a long experience. Have have you uh, had a chance to put a you know piggyback uh, lens for a you know uh, that uh, uh, multifocal design to give them a near vision to a pediatric patient? <laughs> I, I, we just discussed that earlier so i'm putting one uh, not a multi not a toric not a multifocal on the top to cover up and that is one eye care lens which is available they they're charging a 7000 i said you should give us free samples so that we can try if it works we can and, and it's got four haptics it's got a funny loop four hapt i think they told me rajesh has used this before so mm-hmm. rajesh you can put your comments on that yeah i've mean, i've used it in adults adults not- adults we use here yeah. mm. how's the lens is easy to put in yeah it's easy to put in 
it's an 80 eight year old kid so uh, let me try if it doesn't work yeah. i told them i'll take it out i'll do a pi anyway on that one so i don't have experience in the multi- uh, piggyback all on paper whenever when the rainer came i think there was a paper presentation by dr i think kiki math also they said we can use the lens and we can take it out i think if you done so many patients i, I will not do it i will not do it hmm. problem with all these lenses all these is that there is chemosis there you know for long time back uh, we had published a technique uh, which rajesh had written to mm-hmm. make it you know uh, back and uh, cephalotomy after we complete yeah. the surgery the lenses we make a small uh, multiple mix in the anterior lens mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. it becomes a back and type thing mm-hmm. when you have a contraction it's not a circle yeah. postage yeah. 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 Postage stamp. Postage stamp. And that works wonderfully well in the adult patients. Pediatric oh, yes. patients, I have stopped doing pediatric surgery for a long time, so I don't have those follow. But that might work uh, in terms of reducing yeah. the pneumosis in those. So you can try right. that, you know. Mm-hmm. Especially when so your neck is around four, four point five, you that works wonderfully well. In fact, uh, that's one way. The other thing is you can actually make a tangential cut with the scissors and hold it, and just uh, yeah. multiple you can you know rotate again. So rather than giving nicks. which could be weak points if you, if you remove the lens if you rotate the lens if you don't rotate the lens and leave it at the last stop after suturing you make the next it will stay like that it's not going to move but yeah, otherwise uh, after the after you complete everything everything done and you do it yeah that can and be done it, but but dr titial is so difficult if you give a nick with a scissor and hold it and just yeah, go along and with the scaffold of the lens at the back supporting uh, love you must have tried it and i think it's, it's a cake walk it's not a difficult thing in fact rajesh has published the same thing you know in the all difficult cases like a pseudo solution where you feel there are yeah. no fibrosis coming up so we have done a yag laser you know uh, that slightly uh, adult patient we yeah. have mixed with the yag laser so that it doesn't happen sometimes pupil doesn't dilate on the table but uh, you see these patient after surgery the pupil dilate so you can do these procedure sometimes yeah so which is your yag- best lens for pediatric patients the lens that you use most Are you asking me a uh, doctor titya yeah yes no i am asking you yeah i i i somehow don't use yellow lenses in australia they gave me yellow lenses i use them that's fine but what they said that there's a little doubt of uh, you know uh, uh, not the contrast is the sleep pattern and all those so white lenses i i use uh, i j uh, j uh, lenses i use white lenses they're good lenses and, and uh, it's a special kind of food i use pmm also three piece lens i use is a alcon lens which is a three piece lens we have and i use j and j for the in the bag And Iris Claw I use is a Lensai company, which is a thousand twelve hundred rupees. You try those lenses; I think they're wonderful lenses. They earlier had a problem; one of the claw was overlapping. It's not good, but now they improved that one, and it works good. We all follow good. the same thing. We put the yeah, white lens, but there's no no study in the literature that that has shown that we, have, we are following what doctor indicated, suggested that yellow lens should not be put. Yeah, the Alcon yellow lens has a you know two. Uh, Disturbing thing. One is, you know, it increasing the, you know, uh, the lens surface haze as the time passes. All these lenses get into a surface haze, though uh, vision doesn't get disrupted. But that's the major. Uh, Even the acne of single piece, what we use yeah. at uh, around ten, fifteen years back. Yeah, they all look opaque, you know. Very uh, now. Yeah. They have so glistening. That's not a good idea. Second and second is uh, the increasing glistening in these cases as time yeah. passes. So yeah. These are two uh, things which is better than to uh, you know pediatric patients and uh, yeah. maybe with their their newer generation now uh, material maybe on yeah. maybe that will be suitable for this. True. they got new lenses like a vivinex they have a, a ozone yeah. layer at the back and they say it works fine so there was a japanese study in which they did uh, but uh, did you have done more patients and follow i mean you you can't be so really sure. done in the pediatric patient one thesis yeah, in yeah, pediatric yeah. patient we had done the yeah, thesis exactly. but it was found to be comparable actually there was yeah, okay. additional advantage yeah okay. right ji my baby is getting closer Yeah, so it was a wonderful uh, master class, sir. Definitely, I must say that it was a complete, uh, you know, lecture on pediatric cataract surgery. Very nice uh, cases, very nice examples, very nice discussion. Thanks to the panelists, Dr. Lav Kochigave and Dr. Smita Agarkar, and of course, uh, uh, Professor Tiyas, sir, President, and Dr. Namrata Sharma, the Chairman, Scientific Committee. So. a big thanks to the 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 uh, sponsor or supporter ifka for this uh, 
webinar and our staff mr anil kumar and the website manager uh, mr bageshwar dat thank you all and thanks to all the people who have uh, you know participated it was a very good number participated in this uh, webinar and yes sir you wanted to say something no i, I say so how many the audience were there i mean i can't see the audience from here so i'll just check with the website person and then i'll let you know well, anil started putting today only so i said you should have put a little earlier at least a resident group mein dal ke resident should have been there but anyway it's okay, it's okay. maybe you can have it better next time so big thanks to all of you thank you very much keep keep uh, seeing the you know your lecture which is uh, visible always yeah see, uh, uh, yeah it's there on the iskeres website yeah so uh, many of our uh, uh, talks have gone thousands and 2000 5000 also some of the talks yeah. so keep yeah, yeah. seeing them subsequently yeah. so that's the advantage of this medium now you know true true okay good night yeah all okay of good night sir good night thank, thank you. you thank you rajesh bye god bless bye sir. bye अच्छा बस समस्या नहीं हुआ कुछ ना सब ठीक हो गया आराम से नहीं अच्छा हुआ सर बढ़िया हो गया ये तो कई बार ना समस्या हो जाता है बीच में हैंग हो मेरा बीच में हैंग हो गया था